Hello, and welcome to Wise Word Wednesdays. My name is Elizabeth Plouffe, and I'm here today to talk to you about Jeffrey Gittimer. And he's an amazing author that I have been, um, this is my second or third book of his that I've read. Really love him. Um, and I'm, I'm trying a new format today, so this might be a little weird for everybody, because I have to remember to look at a camera. So today, um, Wise Word Wednesdays is about different books that I read. Um, I'm a huge crazy avid reader and have recently, well, probably in the last year, really uh, moved into more of the business books. Still love my fiction. Um, just finished reading, I think, 95% of the uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle Sherlock Holmes series and love Sherlock Holmes and read a wide variety. But um, today I'm going to be talking about Jeffrey Gittimer's 21 and, a half un 21 and a half Unbreakable Laws of Selling. And I just really like this guy's writing style. Um, he's you know, got over 30 years, I believe he said, in sales and selling and teaching and what have you. And it's a really easy format. I've, I've read some other sales books and I have a few more in my stack that I'm going to be uh, getting into. But he does it in such a way that it's easy to break down. It's easy to apply. It's easy to understand. He doesn't get caught up in all of the sales jargon and, and trying to make himself um, the center of the story. He really focuses on how he can teach you to be successful and use these unbreakable laws. And so we're going to kick it off. And any book that I get that I love, um, or any business book that I start reading, you really want to hope it ends up looking like this, which is all these, you know, stickies across the top, because that means I've really got a lot out of it. And if I ever show you a book and there's no stickies, that's not great. That just means that that author just didn't hit the mark for me or, or what have you. So when I'm just doing audio, you'll hear a lot of the, the, the flicky of the tickies um, on the side and you know that we've got a winner. So I'm going to read some of it to you because there's nothing better than, you know, the author's words themselves. And what he opens up with is at a time when the rules are changing, the laws remain constant. You can change the rules. You cannot break the laws, which is very true. And uh, I've been doing... I did a series with a friend of mine, Marguerite Zimmerman, um, called Sneaky Shit, and it was the six principles of influence, which are used on a regular basis um, in the selling process. And so adding these kinds of things into it, these, these laws and rules, the six principles of influence are laws, sorry, and I'm pausing because they are laws, but they have different rules that apply. And I think that depends on the person using the laws. So this goes a little further um, and talks about the variety of ways that you can use influence and trust and, um, and other things to be successful in the selling process. And so I'm just going to read you a little bit here from the very front. Um, it says, every salesperson is looking for ways to make more sales. And I'm going to break off for a second to say, so this applies whether you are running your own business, whether you are working in uh, an organization, whether you are pitching a new idea to your boss, whether, you know, selling is selling. It, it doesn't mean the traditional used karma. Car, brain is so broken. It's been raining in Ontario for like a week and a half. I think I'm soggy. It does not necessarily apply to the traditional, you know, use of the sales word where um, it's cars or what have you. Anytime you're pitching an idea, anytime you want to influence somebody, anytime you want to, you know, influence the outcome you're selling. So here's what Mr. Gittimer has to say. Every salesperson is looking for ways to make more sales. Sometimes you're pressured to do so because of a quota or sales plan. And sometimes you're on a roll and just want to add to your success. Fortunately for you, there is no one way to make more sales happen. Thank goodness. You get into selling situations where you lose the sale. You're certain that you have won the sale, but something, one thing went wrong. You might blame price, purchasing, bidding, the competition, or some other circumstance, but the fact is you lost it because you broke one of the rules of selling. Was it value versus price? Was it your presentation skills? Was it a lack of proof? Was it that you couldn't build trust, which is so huge? Whatever it was, the result was a lost sale. So he goes on to talk about his expertise and how he got started and what have you, which um, and I don't mean what have you in a dismissive way. I'll, I'll pull up his biography and, and have a quick read of that. Although I think it might be in the back of the book, which would be the smart thing. Um, oh, so here we go. Sorry. Jeffrey Gittimer is one of the most sought after international and inspirational speakers in the world. He has delivered thousands of corporate and public seminars to the largest national and multinational corporations. Jeffrey Gittimer's Little Red Book of Selling, freaking awesome, I have it 
is one of the best-selling books, sales books of all time, appearing on national bestseller lists in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, and Business Week more than 300 times. Jeffrey is also the author of the, little, the Sales Bible, The Little Black Book of Connections, and eight other books with sales of more than 4 million copies. Go, Jeffrey. Jeffrey delivers his value-first mantra each week in his free multimedia e-zine, Sales Caffeine, and I'm really, really bad at reading those types of emails, so my apologies, but his website is so full of stuff, you need to go and visit that. Uh, goes out to more than 250,000 worldwide subscribers. He also delivers his message and content through e-learning training and social media platforms to help his readers sell more and succeed higher. So this guy, uh, he reminds me, or, or vice versa, a lot of Gary Vaynerchuk, where they really focus on value and the value that you're providing to your customers, the value that you're providing to you know, potential clients. And however you provide that, is it through you know, recognizing potential opportunities and addressing them? Is it truly listening to your customers and, and delivering specific solutions? Um, is it making sure that if you are not the right solution, you are referring to somebody who is, which is huge for me. If I can't do the job for you, if I can't, if I'm not the right person, then I'm going to let you know because I don't think it's fair um, to try and take on a project just for the cash when I can't, I'm not, and I know this, the right person for you. So a few of the, the tidbits that I'm going to share with you are some of the points. Um, I'm going to try and find, I'll find it in a second. So your sales voice, what is it saying to you? What is it saying to others? And where is this? Pausing, pausing, pausing. Uh, so this is unbreakable law number three, believe before you can succeed. He says to me, or says to me, he says here, I was at Washburn University in Topeka, Kansas, giving a seminar sponsored by Sales and Marketing Executives International. I'm also trying to do this without my glasses on, which is just never going to be good because mama needs reading glasses. Here we go. I had an informal logistics meeting with some of the association members before the event when Jamie, the young woman who directed me to my preparation room, talked to me about her career. I asked her what she was seeking to become. Her response startled me. She said, I'm still trying to find my voice. I was taken aback because I had expected some alternate career choice or something along the lines of make more money or get a job in event planning. But no, she was seeking something much higher. Jamie was seeking to gain control of herself and her power first and find her career path second. We talked about voice for a while and I began to type in order to capture the thoughts. And this is so important. Um, he goes down on here and he says, how do you speak? Not just the words, the voice that you project. Your voice is a statement and picture of your character, your poise and your persona. It's a statement of belief, confidence and personal power. Where does your voice come from? How do you find it? And once you do, how do you master it? And this was something that I struggled with. I think everybody struggles with. Um, I am by nature uh, an introvert with extrovert tendencies, which means that when I go out into a group, that I, especially ones I don't know, um, my energy can get really sucked out and I can be a little bit quiet. Um, by the reverse, if I'm in a comfortable situation, anybody who's been at an event with you, with me, can tell you that nobody would ever know that I'm an introvert by nature versus extrovert. But it did take me a while for my business to find my voice and to recognize that being myself um, was enough. I needed to believe in that, believe what I could provide, believe what I could do for my clients so that my voice became stronger and stronger. And I've slowly been able to do that. And that's through reading stuff like Jeffrey Gittimer's book and, and doing some other research. So he talks here in Unbreakable Law 7, being assertive and persistent, which means if you just do if you just have one engagement with somebody, you, you're not, you haven't nailed it. Relationships take time. Relationships take effort. And when you are lazy about that effort and when you are not persistent in trying to provide value, you have no opportunity. You ha actually, you, you have gall if you do an ask. Um, and I had this happen to me at a networking event where I had just met somebody, uh, never met this gentleman before in my life, and whatever he was trying to sell me, I already had a preferred service provider. And I explained that to him. Again, guy doesn't know me from a hole in the ground. And he's like, oh, so can you introduce me? So he basically wanted me to give him access to my network and to the people that I value and trust after five minutes of, of connecting at a networking event. I'm, like, I'm sorry, dude. I, don't, I was taken aback and flat out said no. He had spent no time building. If there had been a fifth or sixth time that I'd met him and things had gone well and, and we'd had a good communication, I'd be like, sure, but no. 
So being passive, being aggressive, or being assertive, there are differences in that. Being persistent, knowing when to ask, all falls under these laws. And if you break the law, and for an example, like that guy at the networking event, you ask too early, you have broken the law. And how do you, what happens if you break that law? You get somebody like me who says, <laughs> no. And if you're doing it in a situation where you're trying to sell your services and you make that ask too early, then you've lost that client. And believe me when I say, if by making that ask, you have made a really bad impression, it's going to travel really quickly that you've done that. Don't do that. One thing that I loved out of this book, which was, which I never thought about it this way. Um, let me just find it here. It's unbreakable law number 10, communicate in terms of them, which I already knew that, which I do try very hard to do is that I listen to what my customers and clients want. And for me being a communications person, they're used to having people who want to give them a, a package. They want to sell them, you know, what they want plus add-ons. And I don't do that. I listen to what you need and I actually try and sell you less, which I know sounds weird, but I would rather give you the basics of what you need and build trust with you than try and push on you services that you don't need and you get feeling uncomfortable and, and like I'm not trustworthy. I don't like that. When my core values get called into question, <laughs> drives me bananas. Um, so what he talks about here is beware the new customer. They may be your old customer in disguise. And he talks about drill or hole. What are they buying and what are you selling? And here's the little story. This made a huge impact on me. A guy walks into a hardware store and says to the clerk, I need a drill. And I forgot my glasses again. The clerk says, well, not really. You need to make a hole. If you're in retail and your customer comes in and says, I need a drill or I want a drill or where are your drills, you, the salesperson, begin some response dialogue. Reality, he didn't come in for a drill. He needs a hole. Now, you may have heard some version of drill hole in your career, but you may never have heard what the situation is, how to address the buying motive, how to take control of the sale, how to gain trust, and how to create an outcome vision in the mind of the buyer. Here's the real lesson. And it can be applied to any sales situation when the buyer wants a service or product and needs your help to find the right answers and achieve the required or desired outcome. If you ask what kind of drill you're looking for, you're asking an annoying, self-serving, time-wasting, price-based question. There's zero value to the customer and it's the wrong direction to go in to close a value sale. It's likely the customer has no idea what kind of drill he wants. And you and your sales brilliance are going to point out the drill aisle and be done with it. You smile and say, they're in the hand tool area over by the wall, or here's what's on sale. No, this is your opportunity to become an advisor rather than a traffic director. So far, you don't know what kind of hole the customer needs. How big, what diameter of a hole are you drilling? What kind of material are you drilling into? This is not a euphemism for anything. This is honestly just a drill and a hole. How deep is the hole? Are you drilling indoors or outdoors? I'm going to flip the page and finish the story. If you're trying to show the customer the 3 8 inch drill on sale and the customer needs a half inch hole, you're going to have an unhappy customer. But if you know it's a half inch hole through a wooden post, you can recommend the right drill and also tell them they need a starter hole with a smaller drill bit to ensure a perfect outcome. Okay, you get it. Drill hole want need outcome. So this was really cool. It was thinking past the, the face of what a customer or client is presenting to you as their pain point, glasses off, and realizing that if you listen and if you are actively listening and if you are taking notes and if you are paying attention, a customer, you're building trust right off the bat because you are answering you know, questions that the customer didn't even know they had. You're looking beyond the face of the problem and helping them recognize what the best solutions are and and that you're willing to you know if for an example the 3 8 inch drill was more expensive would have been a better sale for you but you say to them you actually only need a half inch drill and here's a cheaper option you're building loyalty you're building the opportunity for that person to come back and ask for you specifically if you're in a real retail, retail position for them to help you or come back to your organization and recommend it to other people so I could go on reading forever because there's a lot of really fantastic information in this book. It's really easy to read. 
it's really easy to assimilate. And he does say at the end, you know, if you read this once, you're shooting yourself in the foot. And that's totally true. Um, I'm actually going to go back and read both of his books again so that I incorporate it into my ongoing uh, sales thing. But Unbreakable Law 17 is the intent to achieve. And again, with the glasses, success versus fulfillment, which is it for you? And I'll just give you a little bit. This just really stuck with me for some reason. And that's probably because my business is run more by um, fulfillment than it is success. I'm, I'm not looking, I'm going to put the glasses up a little bit. I'm not looking to um, succeed at all costs. I can't do that. It goes against my core values. I'm, I'm looking to be fulfilled by my business and success will come after. So people make goals, life choices, career choices, and business choices, even relationship choices based in large part on their tolerance for risk weighted against their greed. As life progresses, these decisions will be mitigated and compromised based on existing conditions of family and debt often not in that order. When you're young, you have goals and dreams, often verbalized by the statement, when I grow up, I want to be, I want to be a veterinarian or a obstetrician. Neither of which happened because I failed science and I'm allergic to animals. So moving on. As you mature, you may change your mind based on your life experiences. Here are the elements of achievement. You have a drive, you have a desire, you have a goal, you have a dream. Your dream may be different than your goal. Your goal may be to make your quota and become the number one salesperson in your company, but your dream may be to live by the ocean or start your own business. And he says here, love drives true passion. Passion drives achievement. Totally true. Um, so this, this book is a really interesting mix of really practical, applicable advice on sales and the sales technique, but it also incorporates some personal growth opportunities that don't smack you in the face of kumbaya. And for a lot of people, especially those of us like me who are very left brain, it makes it really easy for me to take this on board and assimilate the information. And towards the end, um, one of the last, the 25 and a half, 21st and a half, sorry, Unbreakable Law is love it or leave it, which is completely true. And if, if you were to get anything out of this book, this would be one of the bigger things, which is if you don't love what you're doing, if you're doing it to get by and you're okay with that, that's up to you. Um, I was in a job situation where um, I ended up with a very mild form of, of PTSD after the job ended because the executive director of the organization, and I've talked about it before, was just batshit crazy and um, used leadership techniques that just drove the passion out of her people and just made it really difficult to succeed. And it was one of my major decisions for becoming an entrepreneur was that I never wanted to be in a position again where somebody else had that much control over me and influenced the decisions I had to make in my life around my core values and what I wanted to achieve from fear, from fear of losing my job, from fear of being able to provide for my family, just never going to happen again. So that's not to say that I don't have fear as an entrepreneur. But it's fear I know I can take control of and I can find solutions for. Um, and it comes down to me, which has another set of fear, but we'll talk about that another time. So towards the end, um, if you love what you do, and there's these cool pages in the book that have these wonderful little quotes. If you love what you do, your passion will lead to your, oh, sorry, your passion will lead you to success and your success will lead to your fulfillment. So this is where you need to look at the sales process is what are you getting out of it? And I don't mean that in a necessarily a bank account opportunity. Um, I had a really hard time with the sales process up until recently and had another breakthrough working with um, Holly Simmons, who's a John C. Maxwell certified coach. And she helped me um, look at the sales process and look at my business a little differently in that by focusing on my business and focusing on the uh, paid clients versus the clients I sometimes take on who are free, um, that's not something I do very often. Don't get excited. I have to really, really believe in it. But I have to manage that time more effectively. I am more driven by helping people. So I will spend hours and hours on non-income producing activities because you get that little, you know, adrenaline rush from the help situation. The negative impact of that is that by not working more on revenue generating, um, which again, money doesn't drive me, so that can be a little hard. 
I'm reducing my ability to attend conferences, to take trainings, which I love doing. I'm reducing my ability to go on vacation. I'm, I'm reducing my ability to achieve other goals that require money. And thanks to Holly and, and having that breakthrough, I've now actually implemented uh, the Pomodori technique, um, or I'm in the process. And so this little timer has become my new best friend, where if I start working on non if I start working on non-revenue generating activities, I turn on that timer because I could waste hours making sure that that stuff was done a certain way and not that they get any less quality. I just don't spend as much time on that. Uh, likewise, if I'm starting on a, a thing for a client, I put the Pomodori on, my little timer friend there, and I'm far more productive. Um, if you don't manage your time correctly, you might think you've been working on something for far longer than you have and not getting as much done as you could. So in the end, I got a ton of stuff, um, and time management does factor into this book as well, from Jeffrey Gittimer's book, 21 and a Half Unbreakable Laws of Selling. Highly, highly recommend that you pick up this one, and I wish I had my other one here with me, but I have done a podcast on it before, which is his little red book of selling. And again, it's a nice bite-sized, actionable um, suggestions and solutions. So give it a look. Have a look at his website. His website is awesome and it's got a ton of free resources. He provides value all over the place. I recommend it. That's all I can say. Two thumbs up. Loving it, loving it, loving it. And that's my wise words for today. I'm, I'm going to be switching this up because um, wise words don't always happen on Wednesdays, which is what I was doing before. So it's just, it's wise words whenever they come out of my mouth. Um, but I thank you for joining me. I hope you will uh, take a look at Jeffrey Gittimer's books. And if you're looking to improve your sales technique and your voice and a few other things, um, try and give these resources a, a look. If you are interested in social media, then you can find me on Twitter at MCV Plouf. I am on Instagram. I've actually just switched back to uh, dividing my personal and business accounts. So MCV Communications on um, Instagram or MCV Communications for my website. So I hope you're having a great day. I hope you'll take some steps towards success for your business and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.